can come. So welcome. Today we are looking at faith that can endure the power of darkness. A faith that can endure the power of darkness. And I want to give a background even before we uh, get going. And this background I will do after we pray. And then after praying, we shall proceed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, thanking you for the privilege of studying your word, sharing your word, the privilege of worship even amidst the COVID pandemic restrictions. Thank you that we have the medium by which to share, and we are glad to have all those locally, regionally, and internationally who are and who have joined us. Bless our worship. Make it acceptable through the merits of your son's perfect obedience and infinite sacrifice. And as we look at the faith, the kind of faith, the quantity and quality of faith that is needed to be victorious over the powers of darkness, bless us in our study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think we all know that faith is trust in God, believe in his word, and that faith really works by love. So to trust God and believe his word, we must love him. And therefore, as a result of that faith and love, we will willingly obey God's law of love, God's will by submission to the principle of unselfish, self-sacrificing, agape love, which is the fundamental principle of God's government. I should say now that such was the faith of all created intelligences before the development of the sin problem, before what we call the entrance of sin. But now comes an important fact. That faith that existed in the angels before the development of sin had never, in fact, been tested. It had never been tested. Nevertheless, all was perfection perfect peace and order and beauty and happiness and joy and ecstasy and glory, perfect righteousness and holiness before the development of sin. And as we know, and as I'm stressing in this recap, there was no defect in God's government. God's infinite power functioned through his infinite wisdom, which includes infinite righteousness and infinite knowledge, by the principle of his infinite, unconditional, unselfish, self-sacrificing agape love, infinite power, functioning through infinite wisdom, by infinite love, to produce absolutely, infinitely perfect government in every detail of the creation, so that all was absolutely perfect. No sorrow, no sadness, no sickness, no death. Perfect ecstasy and happiness and joy and peace and order and beauty. Perfect life, perfect development. In fact, we are told, as we know, in uh, the book Desire of Ages, and it is also there implied in the scriptures quite clearly, in James 1, 17, from God the Father, through his eternally and only begotten Son, by his Spirit, all of God's gifts flowed out to all, and in praise and uh, thanksgiving, worship and love, returned to God by his Spirit through the Son, thus completing the circuit of beneficence 
the flow of every good gift from God, the Father. And we are told that since God is love and his government is the government of love and liberty, freedom of choice, all of his creatures enjoy that freedom of choice and render to God unconsciously. They weren't thinking of any law. They just spontaneously and naturally lived the life of unselfish love in the perfect joy of heaven before the entrance of sin. The highest angel also enjoyed all of this and also had that faith and also obeyed. But the Bible tells us that in passages like 1 John 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, he was the first one to sin. He developed, without any justifiable reason, a thought pattern of wanting to exalt himself to be equal with and equal to the Son of God. But since the Son of God is as eternal, infinite, beginningless deity as the Father, no creature, absolutely speaking, can be equal to, equal with the Son of God. And when this was explained to Lucifer, this highest angel who had previously enjoyed all the perfection and glory of perfect love, faith, and obedience, but now mysteriously developed the thinking that he should be promoted to be equal to the Son of God, when that could not be because it could not be. Lucifer then began to tell lies about God's government, his character, and to blacken God's character. And these lies were so cleverly put together that one third of the angels, their faith collapsed. The two-thirds of the angels remained loyal, and though they had questions to be answered, they knew that the time would come when those questions would be answered and truth would be victorious, and they held their faith in God. Though it was shaken, they held their faith in God by Satan's lying theories. Satan suggested that God wanted all the glory, that he wasn't the God of love and uh, freedom that he suggested he was, that he wanted to keep creatures down, and he had a conspiracy plan for him and his son to be always on top, and he was really a tyrant and a dictator and a killer, and that uh, he was no good at all. All of this, Satan said, about God. And one-third of the angels, with heretofore, heretofore sinless Thinking, sinless minds were caught in the trap of Satan's lies and their faith in God's government collapsed. Wow. The Son of God is the exact image of the invisible God and knows, God, knows God's character perfectly. And the question is this before we begin on the looking at our passages. Remember our subject is faith to overcome the power of darkness. So God, therefore, decided to develop a faith in this universe of that, a, a faith in his intelligent creatures in this universe that would be able to withstand any deceptive package of lies, any force or threat or fear that the powers of darkness or any other scheme for that matter would throw at his creatures trust and love. 
You know, we are told that when Satan was telling lies in heaven, God could not at first even answer. This is the omnipotent, almighty God. Because had, had he answered to try to explain too early, he could have lost even more angels. That is how terrible lies are. Lies. And we see here that even sinless intelligences were, were susceptible to believe in lies, let alone us sinful fallen creatures on this earth. Well, human beings love a lie. And the Bible tells us, let all men be liars and God alone be true. So Jesus says in it, John 8, 44, that the devil was a liar and therefore a murderer from the beginning. And the major lies he told were and are lies about God. He painted God as having darkness. But we are told in 1 John 1, 5 that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So darkness is the antithesis, the opposite, diametrical opposite of light. Light is truth, righteousness, infinite wisdom, infinite power, infinite love, order, peace, perfect life. God's light is that he always does what is best for his creation out of the motivation of infinite love while leaving his creatures free to trust and uh, obey, or if they choose any other path, he leaves them to their choice if they are fixed in their minds that they do not want him. But Satan painted a picture of God, that God is a mixture of good and bad, light and darkness, and this picture is believed by most people, even religionists believe that God has a mixture of light and darkness. And they even quote scriptures that they don't correctly interpret to support that falsehood that Satan started in heaven. So Jesus was the exact image of the invisible God. When he came here, it is recorded in 1 John 1, 5 that Jesus left a message that John caught. The message is, 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So all who believe that there is darkness in God, they have been deceived by Satan's lies. And Jesus came to deliver them from the satanic lies. Now God's universe is made to run on fantastic laws, laws of geophysics and chemistry. When they were all created in the beginning, they were created perfect here on earth because of the fall. We now have sinful fallen bodies, corrupt and uh, mortal. Nature goes wrong. There are pandemics, earthquakes, storms. Everything goes wrong. Of course, not only at the fall of Adam, and we'll come back to that in a minute, but after the flood and thereafter, successive falls have further damaged creation here on planet Earth and our surroundings by sin, which separates from God's perfect, glorious control. So anything can go wrong on this planet because of sin, not because of God. And God is so good, he's busy holding in check. That was what we were talking about when we were talking about the angels holding back the winds of strife. God is busy holding in check the forces of evil to allow us probation, to allow us a chance to understand the issues and make up our mind for his government or for Satan's government. And Satan is such a master of deception. He now has a lot of people saying that, that there is no such thing as God or the devil. There is no such thing as absolute good or evil. So the world is in a mess. And because of continued transgression of God's law of love, continued transgression of moral and natural law, things will continue to collapse. And God cannot and will not work miracles to correct these issues of sin because he has to let the great controversy run its course. If every time something went wrong, 
God miraculously, because we like that word miracle without really knowing what it is, God miraculous, miraculously put it right, it would appear that Satan's government is good. Uh, of course, when Satan came to our first appearance, at that time there was a perfect earth, the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve perfect, perfect and sinless, innocent in their thinking, perfect in their structure. And Satan deceived them with the same lies. He told them that God was a liar and that when God told them not to eat of the fruit, he was trying to keep them down. And that when God told them if they eat of the fruit, they would die as the natural consequence of separation from his way of life. He also told them that God was a lie and that, they, that God was lying and that they would not die if they disobeyed God. So he came to Adam and Eve with a package of deception and Adam and Eve fell. And our planet became the place where Satan has set up his government of darkness and concretized it. So now, how could God get creatures to have a faith that would withstand the powers of darkness? How could God immunize the universe for all eternity to come, never to collapse in the face of any, any attempt to deceive. So our subject is faith to overcome the power of darkness. And we go to the Bible here in Luke twenty two fifty three 53, to see this power of darkness being mentioned by Jesus Christ. Jesus was about to face the cross. And this is what he said when he was arrested by those who rejected him and therefore rejected his father's love and his father's government. Jesus said, Luke twenty-two fifty-three, 53, when I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. Notice the statement now, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So Jesus was about to be handed over by his father to the power of darkness as our substitute and surety to bear what we should bear, what, what we should have borne, and in, going th and in going through the attack of the power of darkness, as we shall see, Jesus would develop a faith called the faith of Jesus, which is the only faith that can be victorious against the power of darkness, which faith he gives to his people, and which will be fully developed uh, in terms of of the church in the final generation of living saints. We had marvelous examples of this faith of Jesus before, of course, Abraham, Noah, and so on. But in the end time, the faith of Jesus will be on marvelous display in his remnant people. But Jesus, of course, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, so all before the cross as after the cross have been, are, and will be saved by the faith of Jesus. Jesus developed this faith of Jesus, sometimes also called the mind of Jesus, in our sinful fallen flesh, as our substitute and surety, depending entirely on his Father and not using his own divinity. And this faith of Jesus is the only faith that can stand in the hour of the power of darkness to come, as Jesus had to develop it in the hour of the power of darkness he faced at Calvary. So he says, this is your hour and the power of darkness. We also have mention of this in uh, Ephesians 6, 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, 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 against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. This is a description of Satan and Satan's government. And the one-third of the fallen angels who are with Satan, they are called the powers of darkness. The powers of darkness. They are completely opposed to everything that God stand for, stands for. They are against God's love, God's righteousness, God's wisdom. All they want is for God's power to keep them alive because they, they know that they have no power to keep themselves alive. 
but they want to do everything else according to their principle of selfishness, Satan's government of darkness, he and his fallen angels, and human beings who have chosen to join him. Principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, of course, Satan, one of Satan's deceptions in heaven was that he told the angels they did not need law. Now, up to that time, to see how lies can twist your mind, up to that time, the angels were not even conscious that they were obeying law. So spontaneous and natural was the law of love that was written in their hearts that they willingly and gladly and spontaneously obeyed God without any thought of law because the law was written in their thinking. And when Satan raised the question, he raised it in such a way as to suggest that they were slaves to this government of God and uh, they need to be liberated from this government of God. They didn't need a law. They could do as they like. And so, the powers of darkness are terrible. You know, all the evil in the world is the result of the satanic powers of darkness. All the pandemics, all the sickness, all the earthquakes, all the disorder, all the crime, all the lawlessness, as human beings join Satan in his rebellion against God's law of truth, love, and righteousness. And since God runs the universe on the best laws on which the universe can run, laws that God has allowed mankind wisdom to see down through the ages, great physicists like Sir Isaac Newton and others, and tremendous laws in mathematics and physics and chemistry, so that even in a fallen world, we see how much wisdom and knowledge there is of God in creation, though fallen. And God holds these sin-damaged forces of creation holds them in check, lest they collapse completely. Were God to let go and hand our planet over to Satan, because Satan claims he's the rightful ruler after deceiving Eve and getting Adam to disobey. If God were to hand our planet completely over to Satan, well, there would be complete destruction. And we saw when we were looking at the blowing winds that the angels are holding back the winds of strife. But gradually, as human beings reject God's truth and God's gospel and Jesus Christ who came to save us and reject the spirit, the angels are loosening. They're not going to completely loosen until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads, but they're loosening bit by bit. And every little bit of loosening allows the forces of nature to be more susceptible to collapse and also allows Satan and his demons to manipulate to cause more evil. God is not the cause of evil. He's not the cause of darkness. He is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God destroys no man. All who are destroyed are destroyed by the principle of sowing and weeping when they reject God and reject all of God's principles for life and order and happiness and peace. And God gives them up. Their own rejection means that, that they're sowing the wind and will reap the whirlwind of complete destruction and ultimately annihilation. So the troubles in the world are not caused by God. And people ask, why is not a compassionate God, as Christians say, doing anything? God has done everything. He has sent his son into this world, his eternal son, to take on our fallen flesh, to perfectly obey for us, to show us the way of love and unselfish love. And we are told in scripture that Jesus went about, he was destroying the works of the devil. How? He was healing the sick and resurrecting the dead, which means that sickness and death were the works of the devil, that he was destroying by undoing them and restoring health and life by the laws of love and wisdom and righteousness. So Satan's falsehoods, 
in heaven and now on earth have done and are doing a, a nefarious work of deception. And Jesus came to fully reveal the Father's character, to fully reveal the Father's government, to show that God is love, that God is not a tyrant, that God is not a dictator, that God is not a killer, that God doesn't send disease. And, and when the Old Testament language uses things like God smites and God sends, the translators of the King James Version uh, missed the permissive sense in the Hebrew. God permits because he's given freedom of choice. If a man chooses to get up and take a gun and go and shoot another man, that man is exercising freedom of choice in the wrong way. The Old Testament language would say God sent X to shoot Y. No, it means in God's allowing freedom of choice, this person is choosing something wrong. And God doesn't force himself on us. He wants us to willingly choose his way. By now, choosing, of course, the plan of redemption in his son. So moving on then, we have also Romans 8, 32 mentioning this concept. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up. Now, this is amazing. Satan's government of the power of darkness, concentrated on this planet, hates God. Hates everything that God stands for. God is light, 1 John 1, 5, and in him is no darkness at all. And God, to demonstrate his love, because Satan said that God was only talking love and talking freedom. But God, to demonstrate that his love was not talk, but it was in fact infinite, unconditional, all-embracing, all for the other, none for self, agape love. His only begotten son, the exact image of the father, his very logos, word, wisdom, he sent him in human form, human nature, into the very area of darkness that Satan calls his own, this sinful fallen world. And Jesus came to buy back, B-U-Y, redeem mankind, redeem the, 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 the earth, the world, to reveal God's character because everywhere Satan's lies were believed, rebellion was the result. And once God's character was revealed, men could be won back to God. And if they rejected Christ's revelation of God's character, well, then they would commit the unpardonable sin, that is, complete rejection of the Spirit of God. And God sent his son into our world, and the time came when he had to give up his son to the power of, power of darkness. So the son said, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Imagine the father delivering up his son to the power of darkness, to suffer all the hurt and damage which we can never imagine of the power of darkness, to develop a faith that would be absolutely secure against the onslaught of the power of darkness and to give us that faith as we approach the end of time to have that faith fully developed in us. And of course, 1 Corinthians 5.21 shows us exactly what it means. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the father delivered up his son, actually treated his son as sin, threw him into, threw him into the arena of the power of darkness and the son had to endure all of that and still maintain his faith and develop that faith to the gold standard and that is the faith of Jesus, the only faith that can be victorious against the power of darkness. And praise the Lord, we have that faith in him. Hallelujah. The faith of Jesus. So Paul says, as we shall see, that famous text, Galatians 2, 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of 
of the Son of God. So we are to live by the faith of the Son of God. That faith of the Son of God is to mature and develop in us until it reaches the gold standard quantity and quality so that during the final crisis, when we are also going to be facing the hour of the power of darkness, we will be victorious because Jesus defeated the powers of darkness at Calvary and his victory is ours in him by having his faith. So we are told concerning the final generation, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And true obedience must always be the result of genuine faith working by love to surrender to God and to obey God willingly, motivated and energized by the love of God. And Jesus developed that faith in our sinful fallen flesh and as the second Adam he embraced all mankind and we have that faith of Jesus that love of Jesus that righteousness of Jesus in him and that is the message to the Laodicean church Revelation 3 14 to 22 he says I counsel uh, I counsel of you my counsel to you is this buy from me and we are buying without money as Isaiah says, buy from me the gold, the white raiment, and the ice of the gold is the faith of Jesus working by the love of God. The white raiment is the righteousness of Christ, his perfect obedience, even unto facing the powers of darkness, facing the terrible separation from his father called the wrath of God the consequences of the powers of darkness, and Satan was there attacking him during that terrible time. But Jesus endured it. He kept his faith in his Father. He kept his love in his Father. It was horrible beyond our imagination. And, in the, and through the process, Jesus developed his faith to the gold standard quantitatively and qualitatively a standard, a quantity, and a quality of faith that endured complete separation from his father and did not cave in to Satan's force, fear, or lies. That is the faith of Jesus. It overcame the powers of darkness. All the lies Satan was telling, all the force and fear, Jesus trusted his father, loved his father, remained surrendered to his father because he knew his father was right. And as man in our flesh, not depending on himself, for his own divinity, he kept trusting his father amidst the onslaught of the powers of darkness and that faith is ours in Christ for the final crisis. So the apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh. So the son of God came here and took our flesh with all the heredity and liability in our flesh pulling on his thinking Sinful fallen flesh, Paul tells us in Romans 8, 3, and Romans 1, 3, and of course in Hebrews 2, 14 to 17, took the same flesh we have, not the flesh Adam had before the fall, the flesh we have, Jesus took it and submitted it to the will of God by faith working through love to produce the perfect obedience of faith working by love. And then when the time came and the father handed him over to the powers of darkness, he endured the complete intensity of the onslaught of the powers of darkness and developed the faith higher to the gold standard in that period, overcame that separation from his father, which normally would annihilate the sinner, but because he was innocent, in character and victoriously sinless, he abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel and then died the physical death, rose again with the glorified body. In the process of dying and, resurrect, of dying and being resurrected, he gave to the new humanity the very life of the Son of God literally partakers of the divine nature, not just at the spiritual level, but at the structural level in the resurrection event. 
So the redeemed will live by the life of God in the eternity to come and will see God face to face on the earth made new. Oh, what glory there is ahead for those who are in Christ. So Peter says, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, the same faith. So we have the same mind, the same faith, the same love as Jesus because he gives it to us as a free gift when we see it and want it and surrender and ask him for it. Praise the Lord. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men but to the will of God. So Jesus suffered terribly, perfected a gold standard faith, and we are to have that same mind, uh, that same faith. It will enable us to suffer too, victoriously, because we have to suffer. The time of Jacob's trouble after the closure of probation will be a time when, as it were, we are handed over to the powers of darkness to try our faith. And that gold standard faith we have in Christ will be victorious. Hallelujah. And we're told, of course, uh, even before he was handed over to the powers of darkness fully in the Gethsemane Calvary scenario, we're told in Hebrews 5, 7 to 9, who, this is Jesus, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying. So uh, this is something that we need to contemplate. All through his life, he had to carry the load of human guilt, not his guilt, as an individual, he was always sinless in character, though he took on our sinful fallen flesh. And in the days of his flesh, he had to carry the load of our guilt and still feel the pull of our flesh on his mind and submit our flesh to the will of God and keep himself surrendered to God against every satanic lie and strategy and attack and force and fear. So he developed that faith of Jesus through his life and perfected it at Calvary to the gold standard, the faith of Jesus, which is the faith now that the people of God, the people of God are saved by that faith. The people of God, the remnant people of God will be victorious in the great time of trouble by that faith. And the unfallen realms they're looking on, and by that faith, they are rendered secure from any future defection. So the faith of Jesus renders the universe immunized against any other attack of any suggestive alternative to God's uh, government. So Jesus had to cry out with strong tears unto him that was able to save him. You see, he, he acted as a man in our place. He didn't depend on his own divinity. He didn't depend on our flesh, which he took on, because that was useless. He had to submit himself to God, trusting only in God through the Holy Spirit. He cried out to God to save him from death, and he was heard. He was heard in that he feared, in that he submitted and loved and respected. And though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. And now watch this. And being made perfect, perfect in faith, perfect in character, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Praise the Lord. Just look a little bit at the ordeal Jesus went through. Uh, this is the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 1107. Listen carefully. Be astonished, O heaven, and be everlastingly ashamed, O inhabitants of the earth. With sorrow and indignation, the angels heard the choice made by the people and the sentence passed upon Christ. This is describing Christ after his arrest, before the high priest and beaten and all the horror. It goes on. The angels were, uh, look at it here. The angels were uh, indignant. But they could not interfere. Watch this very carefully. We must understand the issues in the great controversy. People want God to arbitrarily interfere and do this and do that and do that. When God has allowed Satan time and scope to 
expose himself and his government. Satan claims that his government is better than God's. So God has given him time and scope to show how his government functions, and God cannot intervene to reverse. These things we need to understand. That is why God has given us laws, morally, laws, spiritually, laws of prayer, laws of body, and when we are by faith in Jesus obedient to these laws, we get the benefit of the obedience. But still remember, in this sinful fallen world, things can always go wrong. The best Christian can get into an accident. The best Christian can be in an airplane that crashes. The best Christian can get cancer or some other illness. And people usually say, well, why did so-and-so happen to so-and-so? The important question is, why did Jesus undergo all of that suffering to be murdered? Because this is the nature of the warfare. We have to feel pain and anguish in this sinful fallen world, but God promises to heal it all in the resurrection when we get the new body in the kingdom of glory. All sickness and suffering will be over, but we have to go through this period and in going through it, whatever happens to us, let the faith of Jesus be manifested to give God the glory. So watch it. The angels could not interfere when Jesus was being manhandled and beaten and spat upon and cuffed in his face and brutally scourged. Woo! They couldn't interfere. For in the, watch this now. For in the great controversy between good and evil, Satan must be given every opportunity to develop his true character. And he's being given that opportunity. So when we see the earthquakes and the tsunami and the pandemics and all of that, this is Satan having his opportunity to develop and show his true character. And all he's showing is evil. Because if every time evil was about to happen from Satan's government, God were to intervene and produce perfection, Satan would say, you see, my government is perfect. You know, he's such a master deceiver that people would believe him. So God has to allow him his scope to show his government. And anybody with a basic modicum of common sense should see in the word of God and from the word of God that Satan's government is the cause of all evil. God is holding in check the evil, giving us time to choose and to, for the final generation of living saints to be sealed. And then the time will come when God will let go and then Satan and sin and sinners will be no more, and God's people and the rest of the unfallen universe having been clearly uh, made loyal by the faith of Jesus will enjoy the bliss, the ecstasy of eternal glory forever in the future eternity as we use that term to describe it. So continuing this quotation, Satan must be given every opportunity to develop his true character that the heavenly universe and the race for whom Christ was given his life might see the righteousness of God's purpose. So Satan charged that God was a trickster, charged that God was a liar, charged that he had a better government than God. So God allows Satan the time and the scope to show his government so that God's righteousness might be understood by all. Those under the control of the enemy must be allowed to reveal the principles of Satan's government. So, two governments at loggerheads, God's government using only truth, righteousness, and love. Satan's government using deception, lies, force, fear, and violence. And now we come to some important points as we continue. Desire of AJ 753. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. Oh, what love. Oh, what salvation. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. Oh, what a God. God could have given us up the moment Adam sinned and that would have been the end of us in Adam. But no, he sent his son out of pure love, proving Satan false and took all of our guilt and shame upon his son, and his son suffered the consequences of the power of darkness, which should have been ours. The son suffered it. 
and pay the redemption price for mankind and pay the redemption price for the earth. So this earth is going to be made new and the new Jerusalem will come down on it and oh, what glory that will be. We are not to let the things of this world sidetrack and distract us from preparing for the kingdom of glory by accepting Christ and abiding in Christ. It goes on to say, the guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. These are verses 753. Paul says he was given up. He was delivered up. Jesus says it was the hour of the power of darkness. He was handed over to the hour of the power of darkness to endure wrath for us, that terrible separation from his father by our guilt. And in that period, he developed his faith to the highest level, quantitatively and qualitatively, at that faith of Jesus, which is the only basis of our salvation, and fully matured in the remnant, will be victorious, will see us to, through to be victorious in the final crisis. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardon and love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, our collective human guilt, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. And yet in that terrible period, he must still maintain his trust in God, his surrender to God. He must still love his father through this situation where he cannot see his father's reconciling face. You see how terrible the powers of darkness were that he had to endure to develop the gold standard faith for me and for you. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced the heart pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by us human beings. So great was that agony of separation from his father, suffering and tasting the horrors of eternal death, that eternal death that hung over Adam and the human race, that his physical pain was hardly felt, and his physical pain was severe, the scourging, the beating, the nails being driven in, his hand there on the cross, the agony of pushing up his spine when his feet got tired, the physical pain was horror, and yet it was hardly felt because the pain, the spiritual pain of separation from his father and suffering wrath, suffering the power of the, the hour of the power of darkness being delivered up for us, that agony made the physical pain Hardly felt. What a love. What a salvation. To reject this is to grieve away God's love, God's spirit. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In other words, that is what he meant when he told his disciples, when he, when he told the, the people who came to arrest him, this is your hour and the power of darkness. So he was under the complete attack of the powers of darkness and amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe, not just physical suffering, terrible as that was, but separation from God, which is beyond our comprehension. He suffered and tasted eternal death for all men, but because he was innocent, he abolished it, he conquered it, he developed the gold standard faith to the highest standard, quantity-wise and quality-wise, hallelujah. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his father's acceptance given him before. He was acquainted with the character of his father, so knowing God's character and having our minds cleared of all of Satan's lies about God, very important. He understood his father's justice, mercy, and his great love. He understood that his father's justice is to let go, ultimately, those who don't want him because he's the God of love and freedom. And if we don't want him, ultimately, he's appointed a day in which he will give up those who don't want him to the government of their choice. And no other government can maintain life. So ultimate destruction will be their fate. 
not because God kills them, but because when God lets them go to the God they've chosen, that God, self, Satan, whoever it is, cannot maintain their life. Sin separates from God and produces disaster. It isn't God that produces the disaster. It is sin separating from God. We are told in Great Controversy 33, 34, 36, those early passages, God does not stand toward the sinner as the executioner of the sentence against transgression. He leaves the rejecters of his mercy to reap that which they have sown. So Jesus was acquainted with the character of his father. He understood his justice and what that justice means. So he was now suffering the justice, being given up as a sinner. Because he was made to be sin, he himself was sinless. But he was made to be sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21, and given up. And yet through all of that ordeal, he kept trusting his father, responding to his father's love, remaining surrendered to his father, and did not even in a thought allow Satan's lies and deceptions, force and fear to cause him to deviate from the principle of self-sacrificing love. So we have this wonderful statement. By faith, he rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission, he committed himself to God. The sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. Now comes the important statement. By faith, Christ was victor. And this is the gold standard faith at the highest level quantitatively and qualitatively that we are to have and develop to that level ahead of the time of Jacob's trouble. By faith, Christ was victor. So as we come to the close, as related to the first Adam, men receive from him nothing but guilt and the sentence of death. But Christ steps in and passes over the ground where Adam fell, enduring every test in man's behalf. He redeems Adam's disgraceful failure and fall by coming forth from the trial untarnished. So Jesus endured every satanic trial, temptation, attack, force, lies, deception, endured it all, and was victorious. This places man, hallelujah, on vantage ground with God. It places us where, through accepting Christ as our Savior, we become partakers of the divine nature, and thus we become connected with God and Christ. And this is the appeal to us all today. Seeing what Christ has gone through for us all, seeing how he developed uh, that a gold standard faith quantitatively and qualitatively, which faith is given to us and we have to, we have to practice through adversity and trial and difficulty, through sickness, pandemic, earthquakes, whatever. We have to develop that faith also to the gold standard and to the gold standard both in quantity and quality by abiding in Christ, by studying his word, by praying and agonizing, and by reading these accounts of Jesus. We are to, we are to spend a lot of time studying Jesus and those final days and hours as he faced the powers of darkness. The victorious faith of Jesus then. So Paul tells us as we quoted earlier, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God. So we are to live by the faith of the Son of God day by day. And as we do so, that faith of the Son of God develops in us to the gold standard by the time the final crisis hits. And as a matter of fact, going through the final crisis and going through the time of Jacob's trouble and the time of trouble such as never was, our faith continues to develop to the point where it is harvest ripe and then Jesus comes in blazing glory for his sins. We are to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. A Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony is again talking about the testimony of Jesus which becomes ours by faith. The faith of Jesus which is given to us and they love not their lives unto death. So we are to reach the point where we love not our lives even unto 
eternal death. Even if we had to die eternally to safeguard God's government, we would be willing to do it, and that is the surest way to live forever. Praise the Lord. So we're going to close with this quotation here. The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger. This is the faith of Jesus. A faith that will not faint, though severely tried. The period of probation is granted to all to prepare for that time. So we'll continue uh, next time, but we're finishing here. And Jesus gives us that faith, and we are to allow it to grow, mature, develop. Every difficulty, every problem in life we are to see as an opportunity to develop this faith that is given to us, ultimately to the gold standard. Jesus does not give it to us at its utmost maturity. He gives it to us as the seed for us to participate in his sufferings and to be crucified with him and to undergo that development. Oh, what a beautiful thought. The period of probation is granted to all to prepare for that time. May we use our probationary hours in prayer, in study, in meeting adversity and opposition in the right spirit, surrendering all to have this faith of Jesus, which is given to us at conversion, given to us, in fact, when the Holy Spirit is wooing us, continue to develop to the gold standard. May God bless you all real good, and may we all pray for and uh, Look at and study this faith of Jesus, receive it, and seek to develop it to the gold standard, all in Christ, in his word, in his name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our study today, the faith of Jesus, the only faith that can be victorious against the powers of darkness. May we study this faith and study Jesus and the hours of distress and horror at the cross during which he had to bring this faith to the gold standard. Have mercy upon us, forgive us of our sins, give us that faith and enable us to cooperate with you and also developing it to the gold standard through prayer, through study, through meeting adversity in it's such a way that our defects are exposed and cast out and our faith is strengthened. Be merciful to us all and give us a wonderful Sabbath day. Bless all who have joined us and be with us for the rest of the day. In Jesus' name we pray. With thanksgiving, amen.